Um, so open science, it's default, it's the future. Uh, so it's great to be here with all of you. You are young, you're the future of science. So you need to learn about open science now and you need to practice it and you need to um, persuade your advisors to be more courageous in open science. Uh, anybody in this room that is already supporting uh, researchers, maybe from the University Library of Maribor, they will know that um, senior researchers are sometimes reluctant to embrace open science, though they are principal investigators in projects and already have obligations, like um, obligations which can be sanctioned if you don't comply with them. Um, the, okay, and then uh, if you have questions, please do interrupt me immediately uh, so that we can uh, like uh, answer also immediately, hopefully. Uh, Irina has really uh, pictured to you uh, the landscape of open science very well. And um, Irina is really an important person for open science in the world. She was present uh, in Budapest uh, in 2001 when the um, groundbreaking uh, Budapest uh, Declaration on Open Access was um, adopted. And now it's like many years after that and she's still active and supporting open science in Eastern Europe, Africa, and uh, Far Asia, uh, Far East. Um, Europe is a bit uh, special, more organized, um, in a sense that um, Euro uh, European uh, EU member states, uh, the European Commission, and the Council of the European Union, we all uh, form the European Research Area, which means that um, some research principles are aligned. They are the same in all countries. Luckily, this was exported around the world. <laughs> so if you will collaborate with researchers in the, state, uh, in the States or in other countries, uh, as they call them in Europe, third countries, this means any country out of EU, uh, you will have the same principles to comply with. So these are, this is the contents of my presentation. First, uh, something about open uh, European research area, what it is. Uh, then um, there are some obligations that you have in your project if you receive public funding uh, in uh, the European Union. Again, about open access to publications and research data. Uh, this week until Friday, you will hear about the same topics constantly <laughs> all over again, but uh, each time more in depth, right, Daya? <laughs> okay, she will present to you um, data management plans and so on. So anytime more details, and my presentation is the most formal, I guess. It's about formal requirements uh, to grant recipients in Europe. Um, when uh, open science became a mainstream in Europe, it brought with it also citizen science, strong access to involving citizens uh, and asking them about what are their needs, uh, also about topics of research. Uh, of course, um, some open science practices are new to researchers. Uh, we need to establish support. Uh, there was a report uh, by the European Commission which said uh, that in the European Union alone, we need 500,000 data stewards. So data stewards are people dealing with uh, research data. Um, Irina mentioned um, research assessment, uh, which at the moment it's not really uh, appealing um, for somebody who wants to be more, um, who wants to practice open science. So this is going on as well uh, in Europe and is being exported. <laughs> uh, and also copyright is not really very kind uh, to open science at the moment and there are things going on here as well. So about uh, European Open, uh, European Research Area first. Um, 27 EU member states, uh, the European Commission, uh, this is like uh, framework funding, uh, and the Council of the Europe European Union, um, this is like this uh, concept uh, that is called uh, the European Research Area. Um, so in uh, the European Research Area, about 9% of uh, funding comes from Brussels. Uh, these are the so-called um, framework programs for research and innovation. Uh, at the moment, uh, this uh, program is called Horizon Europe. You might have heard about this. The previous one was Horizon 2020, and previously they were numbered FP7, FP5, FP4. 
So this is quite prestigious uh, funding, but it's only 9%, and the rest, about 90%, is national funding. And the idea in the European Union is that everybody has the same principles uh, when um, giving away public uh, money for research. Uh, there are some cross-cutting issues in the European research area. It is definitely open science, but also ethics, gender, and some others, which I cannot list from my head. Uh, and uh, regarding open science, it means that uh, provisions on what you have to do when you receive public funding are the same, whether your money came from Brussels or from Ljubljana, <laughs> sometimes from Maribor as well. <laughs> Um, then infrastructures, um, they need to be interoperable, which means that they understand each other. How can you use um, some research infrastructure if it has different code or code that, that cannot communicate uh, with other infrastructures that you are using in your research? Um, the European research area also includes um, facilities for computing and storage, and there is like um, a lot of money invested into supercomputers uh, it, it was invested in uh, in last years, and one of them is located here close, right? It's called Vega. Vega was uh, like the very famous Slovenian uh, mathematician. And okay, this is sideways, but um, Vega computer has a big data archive, uh, uh, archive for research data, and um, Slovenia's Slovenian repositories are programmed in a way that a researcher can deposit research data sets at the repository and chooses whether it will be stored at the repository uh, server or it will go to supercomputer because it is so big or uh, it will be processed, uh, computed at the supercomputer. <laughs> this is something that is not the topic of this slide. Okay, again, uh, um, support and training, this is something that you do locally, but there is a lot of training material available around Europe, around the world, which is licensed with Creative Commons licenses, uh, which means that uh, original authors are giving you the right to reuse their content. But you have to attribute them. You have to say who was. Uh, you have to um, give information at your newly created uh, education material on open science who was the original uh, author of the work that you used. Uh, this reform of research assessment is something that was um, initiated by the European Commission and now has spread around uh, the European countries. I have one slide on this and one slide on the last uh, line here, copyright reform. So all these lines here, uh, they are some aspects of the European research area, uh, which um, means 27 new member states and uh, European Commission. Uh, this is interesting. Uh, now, the policy alignment here, it usually always starts like this, that the European Commission initiates uh, some um, topic, and uh, the Commission has a joint research center. This is a unit with 3,500 researchers that uh, really thoroughly investigate something that will end as a Commission recomm recommendation or Commission communication. And um, what is here in yellow, it was started with the Commission activities. So um, this European research area is dated in 2000. Um, it started in 2000, and now there is, like they call it, the new Euro European research area where open science became the totally important um, cross-cutting issue. And uh, you cannot uh, complete your project uh, successfully and receive uh, the last chunk of funding uh, if they notice that uh, you did not practice everything that was in the grant agreement. Uh, but um, this commission communication or, or recommendation um, mostly refers to framework programs, uh, which means funding from Brussels. But when it ends, when the topic uh, is part of the council conclusions, this is serious. This is now obligatory for EU member states. It may be that in the process of these parliament meetings, an EU member state does not agree with something that will be in the conclusion, but when it, this conclusion is adopted, it becomes obligatory. So this is now the reason that uh, we have the same uh, provisions um, also in countries. 
And uh, this one is the last one. It's, pros it's really specifically on research assessment and implementation of open science. And here they say that uh, also in EU member states, uh, research assessment should be should change, uh, not to um, evaluate or assess predominantly publications. And when assessing publications, do not assess them uh, with impact factor. This is what Irina has said already. Um, so we have this combination Commission, European Commission, Council. This is Council of the European Union, uh, which uh, is presided uh, each six uh, months by a different EU member state. And then uh, this becomes obligatory and something has to, ca has to happen in the country, in the EU member state. And this is what happened in Slovenia. Uh, regarding open science, uh, we have this new uh, research act. It took a lot of time <laughs> to prepare it, uh, but open science was a chapter with um, three uh, articles from the beginning, and they did not change. They are fully aligned with Horizon Europe. And um, it was adopted uh, in November 2021 and came into force uh, with January this year. So whatever I will uh, show later about provisions on open science in Horizon Europe, it's valid for Slovenia as well. Uh, Slovenia is really a small country, 2 million people only. We have one research funder, Slovenian Research Agency. So this agency has to now um, ask uh, beneficiaries, grant recipients, uh, to practice open science according to this act, to this legislation. Um, this strategy is something that um, the state will ensure. So the state will ensure uh, development of research infrastructures, uh, conditions that uh, researchers will comply without too much trouble uh, with open science provisions. And there was a question about paying for APCs. Yeah, this is an issue. Uh, as Irina said, no grant is big enough to pay for all APCs. So there are different remedies here. Uh, one of them is that um, scholarly communication changes. Uh, so we go into Diamond Open Access Publishing. There is an activity by Science Europe currently. Science Europe is association of European, national European research funders. And um, they support that um, funding for a journal is, um, is received from somewhere else, not from subscriptions and not from APCs paid by authors or their institutions or research grants, but somebody funds uh, publishing. It could be the funder, it could be the university, it could be an association. So this is called Diamond Open Access Publishing and many institutions have signed a uh, Diamond uh, Open Access uh, Action Plan, including universities from Slovenia and the Slovenian Research Agency. Um, the Slovenian Research Agency is an interesting um, funder. They fund research, uh, but they also fund subscriptions to journals for many years already. Uh, but now there is a condition that uh, when we negotiate with big publishers, uh, we are not allowed somehow to uh, pay subscriptions only, but we need to get APCs, APC vouchers, which are then uh, distributed uh, to corresponding authors when they uh, get, uh, when their um, articles are accepted for publication. Also, the Slovenian Research Agency funds publishing of national peer-reviewed journals. I think there are about 140 of them. Uh, the agency publishes a call. Uh, these uh, journals, um, edi editors, they have to prepare uh, the, the proposal and um, it's evaluated and then they get funding. So all Slovenian uh, peer-reviewed journals uh, which receive funding from the Slovenian Research Agency, they are diamond. Nobody pays for uh, reading and nobody f pays for publishing. Uh, this is the result of the previous strategy that we had. It was a national open access strategy for, for publications and research data. And the chapter there said that uh, if, you, if you as an publisher in Slovenia receive public funding, you have to publish fully open access journals with Creative Commons licenses. Uh, this is now um, 
even stronger. The requirements, like strategic requirements about open science, are now stronger in this strategy as well. Um, um, uh, I don't know if you differentiate be between expressions uh, e-infrastructure and research infrastructure. Uh, e-infrastructure is something that everybody uses, irregardless of the topic of research. Uh, it could be like uh, supercomputers or um, repositories, general repositories, some like basic uh, infrastructure. Uh, and the research infrastructures are um, thematic and um, very well research infrastructures in Europe are as fris we will come to this later and in Slovenia we have this uh, action plan which says that we will um, fund national nodes of European infrastructures and also some really national research infrastructures and uh, they are usually uh, managed by either universities or research institutes but they get, they get funding for this. I have borrowed this slide from Kostas Glinos, who used to be head of Unit for Open Science. Yes, that exists. At the European Commission, uh, Director General for Research and Innovation. It's actually quite a big uh, unit now. And as he says, um, the practices of open science are scholarly, openly accessible scholarly uh, publications. All other research outputs should be as open as possible. Uh, here, um, he says that all data should be fair, but it basically refers to all research outputs. It means also soft research software, any other output. Uh, and um, yeah, there are some things uh, which hinder at the moment um, open science, as I said before, rewards and incentives. We need a lot of skilling, um, and uh, one thing that the European Commission really invested a lot, and it started in 2016 only, it's establishment of the European Open Science Cloud, the EOSC. Uh, I can say that um, all continents now have some sort of open science clouds, and they are collaborating, all of them, and aligning also technically, and building the uh, global open science cloud. This is so cool, <laughs> at least to me. Um, so, in the European research area, we have really, uh, like, um, now it became mandatory to practice open science, but luckily, this has happened everywhere in the world. Irina mentioned a UNESCO recommendation on open science, and um, it was an interesting event, a uh, three-day event, uh, when a lady from UNESCO uh, managed to negotiate that everybody uh, present agreed to the text in English and French. And later, in November 2021, uh, this text, text was unanimously adopted by 192 countries. This is like a miracle. Um, and it's now in, uh, in its valid. It's, so this is not obligatory for uh, member countries of UNESCO, but it's highly recommended and they have to report. Countries which are, these 192 countries, they have to report to UNESCO what they did. They will not be sanctioned if they did nothing, but uh, they have to report to UNESCO which steps they took um, to implement some or all uh, recommendations. And to tell you that Irina was part of the, really, uh, the core group that prepared the recommendations so that you will know who was talking to you, uh, to you earlier today. Um, and this is the development from last 14 days. I was so happy about it because whenever we spoke with commercial publishers, they said, yeah, yeah, in Europe you have like open science uh, provisions or open access and plan S and so on. You want immediate open access without paying. But yeah, you are so small, um, like national funding in Europe and the European Commission, like it's only 6%, I think, of the world research funding only. And if um, USA does not join, well, we'll, we'll not do it. But now this is so good. Uh, it's this office of the White House, which issued um, some, maybe 14 days ago, uh, a memo to all federal agencies. They have to change their policies. 
uh, they have to ask in their policies for immediate open access and immediate um, uh, like access to all research results. They have to do it until end uh, this until end of 2025, which is still so good. <laughs> uh, it's groundbreaking, really. And um, another activity that was probably influential uh, to the European Commission and um, to Horizon Europe and to the White House is this Coalition S. This was quite a surprise. In September 2018, a group of European funders, among them, even more surprisingly, Slovenian Research Agency, I'm not sure that they knew what they were signing, <laughs> um, they joined this coalition and their requirement was and has not changed. Uh, if we fund research, we want your publications from the project to be immediately and fully open access. Okay, if you publish in an open access journal or if your article is open access in a subscription journal, Creative Commons like article, of course, it's uh, immediately open access. But if you publish in a subscription journal and deposit a manuscript in a repository, at the moment, the publisher wants embargo. Six or 12 months or even 24 or 48 months. Uh, the coalition S says we don't care <laughs> and publishers were really strongly against this but what happened these principles became core provisions in horizon europe and they came into the white house so i think that this is so good um it's uh, the main this is the main principle of uh, coalition s uh, and uh, they have like 10 other principles and some other um, uh, recommendations and instructions uh, how to comply with this so um, provisions on immediate open access uh, from Brussels funding, from Slovenian funding and other countries in Europe, and now it will be in the, uh, in the USA as well, are these provisions. Uh, this slide you saw uh, in Irina's presentation as well. So now this is uh, something um, that is obligatory. Uh, when uh, the consortium of partners receives is successful with a proposal uh, to Horizon Europe, uh, they have uh, articles in the grant agreement, uh, which um, they sign, of course, the principal investigator, the coordinator signs, and they are now responsible to comply with this. Uh, all um, scientific publications, including uh, short, like articles, and long publications, books, have to be immediately open access. Uh, for research data, it is mandatory to uh, manage the data, to be fair, uh, and to make them as open as possible, as closed as necessary. Not all research data can be open always. Uh, moreover, they uh, want that there is information available about anything that influenced uh, your a report or article or chapter so that uh, somebody from your field uh, will be able to rerun uh, either uh, the research or to rethink what you wrote as conclusions uh, to your art in your article. Um, as an experience of COVID, there was a mild version of this public emergency also before in uh, Horizon 2020 framework program, but now um, <laughs> with COVID, if there will be such a public health emergency, mostly again, or okay, can be any other emergency, um, you have to, if you do uh, relevant research on the topic, then you have to make everything uh, immediately open and available to everybody. As R Irina said that uh, she's managing a community on COVID research data, something like this. Irina really explained very well um, some other open science practices. They are not mandatory if you receive uh, funding in uh, Horizon Europe or, or from, let's say, the Slovenian research uh, agency or from the Dutch research agency. Um, so it's advisable to um, share your research as open as possible and as close as early as uh, possible. And peer review and so on, um, including citizens. Um, the European Commission uh, uses definition of uh, the open access publication from the Berlin Declaration. And
And uh, this is a longer text, quite uh, legal. You have the right to do this and that uh, if you are and so on. Uh, but basically it means that uh, nobody should pay for reading such a publication. Um, authors uh, should remain copyright holders uh, over uh, uh, peer-reviewed publications. This depends on the uh, copyright legislation in a certain country. Sometimes um, when um, researchers write an article uh, during their work hours or they are employed with the university, uh, all, uh, copyright goes to the university immediately and so on, but there are some other arrangements anyway. Uh, copyright holders from public uh, domain should uh, remain as such and they should license uh, their texts uh, with uh, open licenses and the most commonly known um, system of licenses is Creative Commons. I'm sure that you have heard about this before, right? Uh, so um, all of these licenses cannot be removed. If I published my article uh, with Elsevier, um, and I was lucky enough that the university has APC vouchers. I didn't pay anything, and my article in uh, a subscription journal is openly available, open access. I have decided, uh, now Elsevier off offers uh, two possible licenses, is CC BY, this one, it means uh, Creative Commons Attribution. So I allow to use my article in any way, for commercial purposes as well, and to make um, other works. But the other uh, license that uh, not only Elsevier, other commercial publishers also offer is CC BY NCND. That means NC non-commercial and ND non-derivative. I, as the author and uh, holder of copyright, allow everybody to reuse my article, but not for commercial purposes, and I'm not allowing to produce derivative works. And uh, what is really important is that even if you publish your article, open access with Creative Commons um, license, and this file now is available on the website, the real open access as considered by European funders is, your co you comply with it when you deposit it in at least one online repositories. Your question was very good about research, Edu, and uh, uh, research uh, gate and acam academia. Edu. It's very popular. These two uh, platforms are very popular with researchers. Sometimes um, researchers deposit their um, subscription articles, which is not advisable, because <laughs> commercial publishers then chase you or the university. And the difference is that. Um, these community platforms for researchers, they are not as visible as repositories. You will see later, I have a slide, that repositories have special harvesters. That was mentioned by Irina as well. And um, your visibility totally increases if your either version of record or author accepted manuscript is on in an interoperable repository. So it's really advisable, even if you do not have funding that says you have to do it, that you do it. I'm sure that all universities where you study by now have repositories, and if not, that's not a problem. Uh, Irina mentioned Zenodo. Zenodo is a, a repository, a catch-all repository uh, for anybody around the world, actually, not only from Europe. And you can deposit their publications. Uh, they uh, have versioning there, so it can be different versions of publications and research data and software and so on. So. I really advise that you deposit your publications and other research um, products, research results. Uh, so uh, more into detail about open access to publications. It's so if you receive um, national or framework funding in Europe, uh, you have to make your uh, peer-reviewed articles and longer texts uh, available through trusted repositories. It's not enough that your open access article is available at the publisher's website. Uh, not enough for the European Commission because European Commission uses open air compatible repositories to check if you complied with the grant agreement or not. Um, this sounds very <laughs> sophisticated, but it is not. Open air compliance only means that there, there is metadata in a repository 
which asks which funder, which program of funding, what is uh, the grant agreement number. And this enables uh, the harvester of the European Commission to check around the world. This repository does not have to be in Europe if there are publications uh, originating from a certain grant agreement number. So trusted repositories. What is the difference now uh, in Horizon Europe from Horizon 2020, the previous period of Brussels funding, that previously they just said um, open access publications have to be available in repositories. Now they say through trusted repositories. So uh, probably <laughs> some repositories were not trusted uh, and were not, they were not able to check uh, what's going on. The big difference, and this is becoming a bit difficult for researchers, is that um, embargo in a repository is not allowed. So if your article is Creative Commons, your final version, published version, the expression for this now is version of record, the acronym VOR. Um, if this is uh, Creative Commons, this is really so good, so easy. You deposit or somebody on your behalf, like a librarian, deposits in the repository. Everything OK. Uh, they enter or you enter uh, the information on the funder, the grant, grant agreement, and the commission happily harvests. But if you publish in a subscription journal, um, you have to ensure open access as well. So it's a subscription journal. You did not pay. You did not have money. There was maybe no option to pay APC to make an article in a subscription journal open access. The next option is to deposit the author accepted manuscript in the repository. Uh, so you submit to the publisher a manuscript this is not yet peer-reviewed, and then things happen, sometimes behind closed doors, <laughs> sometimes open peer review. Uh, but finally, uh, your um, manuscript is approved for publication. And this is the version, if you do not have funding or cannot publish as open access final article, this is the version that you deposit, that you store in the repository. All publishers at the moment they uh, require embargo. They ask that full text in a repository is not publicly available. In previous um, framework funding, uh, Horizon 2020, in, and also in the Slovenian National Open Access Strategy, the requirement by funders was that, OK, embargo is allowed, but only six months for uh, nearly all disciplines except social sciences and humanities where the embargo can be 12 months. Even this was difficult sometimes to negotiate with publishers, because um, let's say publisher allowed embargo 12 months, and uh, your funder said six months. What to do? In this case, unfortunately, <laughs> you have to do what um, the publisher says, because the publisher owns copyright, and you cannot breach the copyright. And uh, now. The funders ask you that you have no embargo on your author-accepted manuscript in the repository. The solution now is uh, that um, the European Commission and uh, the National the Slovenian Research Act, they say that um, researchers, or uh, if it is the university, they should keep enough um, rights, uh, intellectual property rights, to exercise such a provision. Theoretically, this is nice, uh, but it's a bit difficult for <laughs> researchers to do this. And uh, Coalition S, that I mentioned before, um, prepared uh, something that is called uh, the rights retention strategy. Uh, and um, this means that um, the funder asks grant recipients um, no embargo. And you can, we also advise you that uh, you use the rights retention strategy. OK, not to go into detail, this means that you announce to the publisher that uh, when you send them the manuscript um, that you will deposit your um, ma author accepted manuscript in a repository and make it fully available immediately. And um, the publisher should accept such a statement and should, should not reject your manuscript because of that. But it might happen. And uh, researchers fear this. So they will probably not practice uh, this uh, 
in big numbers, the rights retention strategy. Maybe the change of copyright will, uh, the change of copyright goes into the direction that nobody would, no researcher would have to negotiate this with publishers, but it, they, it, it would be legally allowed to do this. Copyright exceptions for research, for research publications. Mm, so these are the three possible ways how to ensure open access to um, research articles. The first one is that you published in a subscription journal uh, and um, you did not pay and um, of course it's no cost. Though, yeah, publishers still charge like uh, <laughs> color charges and some other things, quite weird in electronic times. Uh, but anyway, copyright with the final uh, version of the article is uh, with uh, the publisher and um, you need to store your uh, author accepted manuscript um, in a repository. The other two options, they are the same um, regarding the final result. So an open access article licensed with Creative Commons licenses is deposited in a repository. This is legally totally correct because uh, Creative Commons is allowed this. It's uh, the right of distribution and reproduction. Uh, the difference is that um, gold open access means, uh, though sometimes there, this expression gold open access is used interchangeably with open access articles in subscription journals, but um, yeah, um, open access journals, they're fully open access from the first to the last uh, article in the journal. And uh, it's really important that uh, in Horizon Europe or in the national funding, these APCs are legible costs. Slovenian Research Agency has a yearly call uh, way where they uh, repay the APCs uh, that uh, researchers have uh, paid. Uh, the uh, condition is that in that article, the Slovenian Research Agency is mentioned as a funder, and there are some other requirements, but they would not refund APC for another funder's uh, research. <laughs> uh, in uh, um, the, the third option, it's uh, still your open access article, Creative Commons, uh, but it's published in a subscription journal. This was eligible cost uh, in uh, Horizon 2020, the previous Brussels research funding and also in the Slovenian um, National Open Access Strategy, which was valid until, until end of 2020. But uh, funders believed that uh, when allowing this, um, this kind of publishing open access articles in subscription journals will bring um, to change of uh, subscription journals into open access. But it, this, not, this did not happen. And uh, comparing APCs, APCs in subscription journals are totally high. They are much cheaper in open access journals. And also, uh, Irina mentioned uh, directory of open access journals. Sometimes it is problem if you can trust an open access journal or not. If you find that journal in directory of open access journals, you can be totally at peace because um, there is a quality check behind this uh, directory. and. Uh, they, they do not allow, um, they do not include um, suspicious like predatory publishers or journals. Currently, there are about 13,000 open access journals in that directory. And um, you can Google it uh, quite fast. Um, I think that something like 85% of that, of these uh, open access journals in the directory, they do not charge APCs. So this is free. Publishing in these open access journals is free to authors and it's free, of course, to anybody to read. When you publish open access article in a subscription journal, you always have to pay. And the options here are that um, that, that mostly happened in European countries. Um, universities did not negotiate uh, individually with uh, commercial publishers even in print times, uh, but they formed uh, groups of universities and research institutes and hospitals. Uh, we call them like a consortium and uh, a group of people negotiated on behalf of 
such a consortium with publisher and uh, there were some like groundbreaking developments by the Netherlands, Sweden, uh, Norway and when they were successful with negotiating uh, with big publishers like the big three uh, as a very Springer Wiley for contracts which allowed not only reading but also they got APC vouchers there were more requests in other countries in Europe but also in the States like University of California they don't have like national consortium and uh, so this is good for um, researchers and also good for funding I would say um, in Slovenia now we have um, two such contracts with big publishers they have to be three-year contracts it's not possible otherwise but um, I think that we are quite pleased with them because we paid a bit more than for reading only and received um, APCs. So uh, when our authors can be author from the University of Maribor or Joseph Stefan Institute, um, any, any research institute or university part of the consortium, uh, when the um, peer-reviewed, uh, when the, the manuscript is peer-reviewed and accepted for publication, um, the researcher has to enter um, the name of the university, the University of Ljubljana, and it has to be the corresponding author. Benefits in such contracts with publishers can be used only by corresponding authors. Uh, so uh, the publisher's information system automatically recognizes such an author Usually there is a contact person at the consortium or at the university that has to approve this. And this is it. It's quite uh, easy. Uh, so I think that this is good for public funding because only uh, because paying for reading, as ever, it's totally expen expensive. I don't want to breach the contract <laughs> secret, but it's totally expensive. So if you get APCs, it's a bit, um, we feel a bit better. As we saw from the Berlin Declaration on Open Access uh, in Sciences and Humanities, and also from uh, requirements of European funders, your publication has to be deposited in a repository. Um, information that we see here, it's called metadata. Uh, it's something that you can see also in uh, library catalogs. The difference between a library catalog and a repository is that the repository has full text stored at the repository server, not somewhere remotely. Um, so yeah, that's um, important is that we have PDF at our server, uh, that we have information about the funder and uh, also information about licenses. This is important, this part, uh, because uh, these licenses here, they are machine readable and anybody performing um, mining text mining, let's say, can use these articles uh, to, as input uh, into mining algorithms. Otherwise, they would have to ask each individual author for permission to do this. Mm, the open science landscape in Slovenia at the moment mostly consists of repositories for publications which were now, up, now upgraded to um, accept uh, research data as well. It all started a bit late in 2012, 2013 uh, as, um, as a project of uh, four universities. Uh, so at the moment we have seven repositories in Slovenia using the same software, which is managed and produced here at the University of Maribor. Uh, and there is a national portal, which is called Open Science Slovenia. So you see here that uh, this uh, portal harvests uh, from um, these uh, digital archives and also the repositories. And uh, this portal has only metadata. When you want full text, you will click on the title and you will be um, transferred to the repository in question. So, something about visibility now. Um, open Air was mentioned a few times already. Open Air is acronym for Open Access Infrastructure in Europe. 
uh, the European Commission started uh, open access pilot as a policy uh, in August 2008. They thought it was a cool idea because they had some analysis uh, that too much money is spent for research funding, which is then locked in subscription journals, and public funding is used again to pay for subscriptions that uh, pub uh, publicly funded researchers could read this. Of course, after <coughs> they published uh, the policy, they discovered, yeah, how will we uh, control this? I mean, we have no uh, technical means to check what is going on. And they invited partners from Driver Project. This predates your, <laughs> your young age, definitely. Uh, but in all EU member states at the moment, there were uh, institutions, universities uh, mostly, that were partners in a repository project uh, called Driver. They were um, asked to organize a project, and this is the beginning of Open Air. Uh, first Open Air project started in uh, 2010. And after four consecutive project fundings, uh, now it's a legal entity. So what is going on here? Uh, open Air harvests, uh, on behalf of the European Commission, all Open Air compatible repositories. That's good. Uh, but it would, not, it would not be enough, because as we heard somewhere before, um, researchers don't comply with open access provisions in grant agreements, and they don't deposit into repositories. So what OpenAir does, it gets access uh, to um, publisher websites and so on to many, many resources. They call them content providers. And the final result is that OpenAir has information records on 144 million publications, and this is deduplicated because OpenAir gets information from many content providers, and then first what they do, they deduplicate and publish. Uh, they also have uh, records for 17 million research data. Um, okay, I think that the next slide is the one that I totally like, and this is um, the comparison with community platforms. They are important uh, for collaboration of researchers, definitely because uh, at repositories, researchers do not uh, exchange views. They, not, they do not communicate. So they need community platforms. But the real total um, visibility comes from depositing into repository. Let's say this is the repository of my university. And even if it, ha if it has only basic interoperability requirement, which is OAI PMH, it's Open Archives Initiative, protocol for metadata harvesting, this is totally basic, and everybody has it, all repositories, then it gets multipli multiplied so many times, and it's also included in Web of Science. So this is my main argument to persuade <laughs> researchers at my university, but not successfully enough, that they would deposit in our repository. And we would like to ask them that uh, whenever they have a new publication, they are obliged uh, to inform the library, uh, to produce a record for the national CRIS system, because the national funder will check the national CRIS system. CRIS is current research information system. It's information research. We would like them that when they ask the library to produce the CRIS record, that they inform the library or ask uh, for deposit in a repository as well, or even more when their article is Creative Commons article, the librarian does not have to ask anything, can just deposit in the repository. Um, so I'm very happy <laughs> that we have a new rector from um, rector of the University of Ljubljana from October last year. And um, he was um, very interested in open science previous to becoming the rector. And now we have the strategy of the University of Ljubljana until 27. And uh, one of the requirements is that uh, in year 2026, 90% of all publications of researchers per a certain year uh, have to be deposited in a repository. So this is the, the window. The repository of the university is the window of the university. Um, Irina mentioned Open Research Europe. This is... Um, a platform, it's a bit different uh, than a journal. Um, the Wellcome Trust, I don't know if you're familiar with this uh, funder from the UK, they are a charitable funder. Um, Wellcome Trust was one of the first funders uh, to commission uh, establishment of such a platform 
for um, its um, beneficiaries. It's the same here. Uh, European Commission published public procurement tenders twice because they were not pleased with the first proposal. Uh, and uh, now it's F1000. Um, so articles from either Horizon 2020, that's previous framework program, or Horizon Europe projects can be published, published at this platform for free. It's sort of a mega journal. And uh, the European Commission wanted to practice uh, what they preach. So uh, this platform has all uh, new functionalities like open peer review. So when um, the corresponding author deposits on behalf of the authors, there is initial check uh, by the technical editor of the platform. And then um, this, this uh, manuscript is published on the platform and uh, to um, peer reviewers are named. You see their names, and they have certain time to uh, publish their uh, review. But also anybody around the world can comment, of course, if they have time to do this. Uh, this then is, um, there is a decision then by peer reviewers. Uh, we recommend that article is accepted or rejected, or there should be some, um, something, um, some corrections or whatever. And finally, when this is uh, passed, uh, it's uh, published at the platform. Um, this platform is now indexed by Scopus. Not, f not to get impact factor of Scopus, it's named a bit different, uh, but um, to get more visibility. Yes, please. Uh, okay. Um, this is really good <laughs> that I have only five minutes left uh, because uh, I will tell you a lot about research data. I can just uh, say that uh, managing research data, it's now obligation. Um, you have to prepare a data management plan if you receive um, framework or national funding. Uh, but you should not fear this, as Taya will explain to you. There's a lot of, um, um, there are a lot of tools that can help you. And it's basically preparing a data management plan is something that you do already. You think about what I will do, what kind of data I will either uh, collect or um, produce uh, what kind of tools do I need and can I make um, these data openly available or not. There are some tools uh, that uh, these are like information systems that you um, sign in and then you, you have uh, these questions they ask you and you can also reuse existing um, DMPs to get some ideas. And if you are uncertain uh, where to store your data, there are two um, reliable catalogs, uh, Registry of Research Data Repositories and Fair Sharing. Um, not all data can be open. Um, some data can never be open, like uh, and these are uh, Slovenian, this is Slovenian le legislation, but it exists in all countries something like uh, Industrial Property Act uh, or GDPR is valid in Europe. But if your research was done um, together with a company, this happens uh, at the University of Ljubljana, not that uh, rare, um, like with pharmaceutical companies, uh, then you have to agree in advance, okay, who will be the owner of data when we finish the research and which data can be or when it can be public. If uh, your research um, is with people, informed consent is the basis. And uh, there are also some tools available. You can anonymize data, personal data, or pseudo-anonymize. When you anonymize personal data, they can, uh, the process is not reversible. You cannot get identities of people anymore. But if you pseudo-anonymize, you would just use certain texts or numbers or codes for people and it could be um, re-identified. So uh, there is advice by CESDA. CESDA is the European Consortium of Social Science Data Archives. Um, they're like, I don't know, 25 years old probably. Very important network in Europe, many uh, national nodes. So uh, what they um, recommend is obtaining uh, informed consent that you anonymize and that you also um, deposit 
in a data archive that uh, offers different levels of access. Um, this um, acronym ESFRIS, this means European Strategy Forum on Research Infrastructures. Even before open science era, there were strong uh, research infrastructures in Europe uh, and they were funded uh, from Brussels and uh, nationally. But uh, with uh, open science, uh, alignment was stronger and stronger. So finally, in 2016, uh, there was this um, establishment uh, political first about the European open science cloud. Um, now there is a portal uh, where you can see which services are offered. And uh, European open science cloud is not something residing in one computer somewhere in Europe. Or, or something monolithic. It's a federation of tools, uh, research data, archives, and so on. Anything that uh, is used in research. So contribution can be either institutional, national, or European. And uh, the aim, what they would like to achieve is that um, something like European Research Data Commons would be available of findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable data, and that would be European com uh, contribution to the worldwide web of data. And uh, now this uh, EOSC is uh, governed by the EOSC Association. That's a legal entity uh, with, uh, with a seat in Brussels and uh, national representatives and representatives of the European Commission, and it gets partial funding from the Commission. Um, Citizen science is, um, in the European research area is considered sort of part, part of uh, open science because open science means not that, the, that you're open to other researchers, it means that you are useful and open to citizens as well and you also ask them about topics maybe but also you invite them to collaborate in research. Uh, this can be, di this can dif be different um, regarding the topic that you research. Of course, in particle physics, you cannot invite citizens to work with you. Uh, but let's say at the University of Ljubljana, there is a um, European project, it's called WeCount, uh, where um, citizens received sensors and they were um, measuring um, frequency of traffic. And the project, that was a European project in five other countries in Europe as well, uh, in yeah, uh, five cities, five countries. And the final result was that in Ljubljana, uh, some project regulation was changed because they were able to prove to the mayor of Ljubljana that <laughs> there, are not, there are many cyclists there and there is no cyclist lane. Um, so there are some useful tools and Zooniverse is a platform where you can, you can uh, uh, prepare environment for your project um, in which you will collaborate with citizens. Um, yeah, all of us, uh, we need to learn a lot. I don't know if this is a consolation uh, now. Open science is stable, <laughs> I can say. We know what it is. In previous, like, uh, five, ten years, it was maybe here and maybe there, or this is more important, this is less important. Now we know what it is. But um, it's difficult for researchers. Uh, they are very busy people. Most of them teach. They have to do research. They, they have to write proposals, and all of a sudden, they are asked to comply with open science as well. As Irina said, they have to prepare data sets to be openly available. If they don't have data stewards, in Slovenia we still don't have them, there are plans, there will be funding for data stewards. We have to somehow get um, some courses or whatever. So there are things available that you can either directly study. These things are all licensed with Creative Commons licenses, so you can um, somehow prepare them for your stakeholders, as they're called, like your researchers. But, okay, this is more topic for me. <laughs> you are researchers. But still, I really recommend, like, Open Science MOOC. Um, you can study this on your pace whenever you have time. A reform of research assessment. Yeah, I'm sure that um, one of uh, fe uh, fears of uh, early career researchers is, okay, I fully agree with open science, this is really the way to do it, but it might ruin my career. So what to do? Um, San Francisco Declaration on Research Assessment was the, the, the crucial document 
Uh, it happened at the meeting of editors of biological journals, biomedical journals, and uh, now it became really like a standard. The basic thing, the basic principle is do not use impact factor of journals anymore to assess uh, researchers because impact factor tells something about the journal and not about the individual article in that journal. Uh, frequently at presentations, they tell the example of, I think it's nature, uh, with really very high uh, impact factor, but the majority of articles in nature do not have such a big influence, impact. It's uh, some articles have high impact, and now it seems like all of them have it. Um, last, this year, this year, there was really strong activity which was led by Science Europe. I told you already that this is Association of European Research Funders, National Funders, uh, by the European University Association. In Europe, there are many associations, but this one is the biggest. Um, it has uh, more than 800 uh, member universities and something like 35 national rectors conferences from wider Europe, not only European Union. Uh, and with the support of European Commission, um, they wrote together this agreement so now, uh, and um, coalition of these organizations, there were more than 350, not only from Europe, but from other parts of the world. So this agreement now is, uh, will be, is available. Uh, I think that now, somehow now, um, institutions will be asked to sign it. This agreement does not say <laughs> you have to abandon impact factor in one year. You just commit as a university or research institute that you will start the changes and you will report back to the, uh, this coalition. So from Slovenia, uh, it's the University of Maribor that uh, was part of this coalition, the University of Ljubljana and uh, the Slovenian Research Agency. It sounds promising, <laughs> but we will see what we really, f uh, and this is now the last slide, <laughs> Brina. Um, at the moment, copyright is complicated for science, for researchers. They have these options um, when publishing in subscription journals. The easiest thing is to just sign copyright transfer agreement. And this is totally too much. You transfer all copyrights over your text to the publisher in return that uh, it will make it, it will publish it, it will design it a bit. You produce nearly everything so far. <laughs> the publisher will design it and publish it. And of course, journal will be indexed. Um, so, uh, the idea now, and these are the first analysis, this is maybe one year, one week old, not, it was recently published. The idea is that um, research publications would somehow be exemption from this copyright in a sense that researchers would not have to bother with this, so they would, they would have the right uh, to do it. And they would even be forbidden is a difficult word, uh, to sign over, they would not be even able to um, give over copyright to the publisher or any other entity. And thank you for your perseverance. <laughs> that was it from my side.